welcome everybody. It's really a pleasure uh, to see you all today. Um, just a little, a little background about myself, where I'm coming from, uh, where we're going to, I guess, is, a, is another important question. Um, as Dr. Friedman said, uh, I practice emergency medicine. I'm actually from uh, Wisconsin originally. Uh, my father, may he rest in peace, was a rabbi in the city of Milwaukee. I grew up in Milwaukee, came to uh, New York for Yeshiva University, attended uh, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. Uh, my clinical practice is now uh, emergency medicine. I actually trained and received rabbinic ordination from, uh, from Yeshiva University as well. Uh, and my, my interest and passion really is the relationship between science and medicine and Judaism. And, uh, and our presentation today will be just a, a tiny fraction of that very large topic. Uh, and I, I'm delighted to, uh, to meet you all today. I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation with all of you if you're interested in, the, in this field and uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to meet again in the future. Uh, the topic that we're gonna do today is, uh, is one actually which uh, when I tuned in uh, was, uh, was just being discussed and, and that is, uh, is actually vaccination. Uh, a topic which, of course, is on none of our minds. Uh, none of us are thinking at all about vaccination today. I don't even, I don't even know why I came up with that topic, but uh, just out of the blue, I figured uh, it's something we should talk about. But, but seriously, uh, and, and not so much a, a conversation for, for today, perhaps a conversation later on, um, my clinical practice is emergency medicine, so I have been literally in the thick of this COVID pandemic since the very beginning. Um, I actually contracted COVID myself back in the, at the end of March and April, pretty serious, thank God, not, not hospitalized, but I was bedridden uh, with terrible illness for a prolonged period of time. And, uh, and shortly thereafter returned to, uh, to treating COVID patients uh, here in New York City, uh, where I've seen uh, myself hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients uh, and our hospital has seen many thousands of COVID patients. Uh, so I am uh, unfortunately well aware of the, of the nature of this current pandemic. I'm also uh, well aware of the excitement and anticipation of this vaccine. Uh, as a frontline worker, so-called frontline worker, I actually received the vaccination already. I received the first dose of the vaccination. I don't know if anyone on this uh, Zoom has actually uh, received the vaccine yet. Um, I received the Pfizer, the Pfizer variety of uh, vaccine. Uh, thank God uh, it was over a week ago, so I had uh, a little bit of arm tenderness, but that was it. No other, no other major issues or, uh, or, or, uh, or medical uh, uh, complications, thank God. And uh, uh, such I can report also uh, anecdotally from, from a number of my colleagues. By the way, I have the chat uh, open for those of you who want to ask questions along the way. This is a, you know, an, a sort of informal presentation. I'll be using a PowerPoint, but feel free to interject at any time. To ask questions at any time or clarify um, if if you so uh, if you so wish. Um, so uh, so vaccination is something which even before COVID nineteen, even before my personal experience with the uh, with this disease and receiving the vaccination myself, um, is is a topic that I've actually been very interested in, um, and uh, a topic uh, not uh, from the Jewish perspective. What does Judaism have to say about vaccination? something which we as, as Jews should be thinking about in addition to the global conversation about vaccination and the extraordinary developments in science. Uh, part of the objective of this kind of endeavor is to put, put that science and, and medicine in the context of, uh, of the tradition that we bear thousands of years of, uh, of Jewish tradition. So what I'm gonna do today is something that you would uh, probably not get in most of your conversations. I, I, I don't make any assumptions, but I, I would expect that many of you have have read or heard about a lot of the science of the contemporary vaccine. My, that's not my objective to share with you today. I'm not going to talk about the similarities between uh, Pfizer and Moderna and the differences of AstraZeneca and, uh, and others and, uh, and mRNA uh, uh, the technology, which is a new technology. I'm not going to talk about that specifically. At the end, by the way, I'm happy to, to entertain the specific questions about those things uh, and answer to the best of my knowledge. Um, but what I'd like to today is, is give us a little historical perspective about vaccination uh, and actually to go back, to hark back to the very first vaccination in all of medical history uh, and to, uh, to see what that was like 
and to see what some of the issues that arose for that particular vaccination and, uh, and the halachic issues, the Jewish legal issues that were discussed back in the 1700s and the 1800s. By the way, someone in the, in the chat just wrote, where do I practice? My, my clinical practice of emergency medicine is at a hospital called Montefiore Medical Center. Montefiore Medical Center is a, a major teaching hospital in the Bronx. It is actually the teaching hospital for the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, I'm now going to, uh, to share with you our presentation for, uh, for today. Um, maybe guys, just give me a thumbs up to make sure you can see it. Thumbs up. You guys can see the uh, presentation. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, uh, let me just see if I can uh, get the chat open on the side over here so I don't lose that. Okay, great. I guess I got the chat open. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about vaccination and contagious diseases in, in the history of rabbinic literature, really sort of getting ourselves up to speed up to the, up to the, 21st, uh, up to the 21st century. Uh, and here you see a picture on the left-hand side of, of a so-called plague physician. Um, some of you may have seen this, uh, this illustration. It's a famous illustration. There's many variations of it. Um, and you can see the, the physician, um, uh, let, let, and you can see the uh, physician on the left-hand side um, who was who gowned really head to toe, full-length coat, gloves, uh, hats, long boots, etc. cetera. Um, you also will notice this, this uh, mask that he's wearing is slightly different mask than we have been used to in the, in, the, <laughs> in the recent past. You notice there's a little protrusion on this mask or beak. Um, I apologize, I can't ask you questions to respond because we're on Zoom and uh, don't have the pleasure of being in person, but, uh, but let, me, let me share with you why it is that this, this beak exists. The reason this beak exists um, is because uh, when a plague physician would walk into a, to a, a home where patients would be afflicted with a disease, um, and I apologize for being a graphic and I hope you didn't uh, eat lunch uh, too recently, but, uh, but the smell of uh, rotting flesh could be extremely profound to such an extent where it would be challenging for the physician to even walk into the house. So these, uh, uh, this little beak contained uh, sweet smelling substances, uh, may have also uh, believed to have been believed to have had some medicinal value, prophylactic, protective value, uh, but it was mainly practical to, uh, to uh, cancel out the other fumes and odors in the, in the environment so the, the physician could actually practice. Uh, and if you look on the right side here, you'll see uh, a physician in hazmat gear. And this is actually a picture of me. Um, I, I apologize, this is not, this is not my um, COVID-19 hazmat gear. I have to update the picture to the COVID-19 gear. This is, this is actually the Ebola gear. Uh, we, we are actually a, a, a Ebola receiving center in the Bronx when Ebola was, was a scare back uh, a, number of, a number of years ago. Um, and you'll see it's not, this, this uh, hazmat gear is really not dissimilar to the, uh, to the medieval physician. Uh, of yesteryear in terms of what they would wear, gloves, long gown, boots or booties, uh, protective uh, environment, really, really similar. Um, and the disease which we're gonna talk about now uh, for the next little while is a disease which you see in front of you. This is a picture of a, of a hand with a particular disease. Now, I sort of already gave it away with the title, but uh, you know, if you guys want to just enter in the chat, for those of you who didn't pay attention to the title, what, what disease do you think this is on, your, on this patient's hand? Okay, so you guys saw the title, but that's okay. The, uh, the disease is smallpox. This is a disease called smallpox. Uh, and in fact, um, if I were to ask you how many of you uh, have actually seen a case of smallpox. Um, I, I know for at least uh, those of you who are in, uh, in university setting, uh, the, younger, the younger crowd, uh, the answer would be none of you. None of you would have actually seen a case of smallpox because there hasn't been a case 
of spontaneous smallpox since the 1970s. And that's exactly what we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about uh, today is what is this disease smallpox? What was it like in the past centuries? And why is it that we don't have a, uh, don't have this disease at all today, which is really quite extraordinary that there's, there's been no, absolutely no cases in the 20, late 20th and early 21st century. Uh, this disease was described very early back in the 900s, and we'll see it probably goes back even earlier than that. This is actually what a, on the left side, what a severe case of smallpox is like. Um, but in paleoarchaeology, for those of you who are familiar with that particular discipline, they've actually identified smallpox on Egyptian mummies. Uh, and one of the Ramses, uh, of the, uh, which is one of the, the, the pharaohs of Egypt, uh, we're reading now in the Torah portion of the week about, uh, about Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. Uh, one, one of the Ramses, Ramses V, who, was, uh, who underwent some medical testing uh, of his body that was discovered in Egypt, has, has spots on the face, and those are believed to actually have been smallpox. So this disease goes back uh, quite a ways. Um, what was believed to be the cause of smallpox in the, in the pre-modern era? Um, and I'll actually go off uh, screen sharing here for just a second. The, uh, the book uh, that, that I'm gonna reference um, on this slide that I'm gonna return to in a moment uh, is called Otsar HaChaim. Otsar HaChaim was, uh, was published in 1683. The reason I'm going off screen is because I'm gonna show you an original copy of this book. This is the original copy of the book. This is the 1683 version. Um, and uh, it's actually never been uh, republished. It was written by a Jewish physician who graduated the University of Rome back in the 1600s. Uh, while we won't be discussing today, there's, there's actually a fascinating passage uh, in this very book. We're, we're gonna be talking about his passage in the book about smallpox. But there's also a passage in the book about uh, a plague when there was a, a pandemic, if you will, or an epidemic in the city of Rome. And uh, he was actually, uh, um, he's writing about it a number of years after it happened. Uh, but in his discussion about fevers in, the, in this medical book, by the way, it's a medical book written in Hebrew for the Jewish community in the 1680s. Um, and he writes about that plague and what it was like for, for people to treat the plague. He talks about Jewish physicians who, uh, who sacrificed their lives treating the Jewish community in times of plague back in the 1680s. Uh, and it is uh, it, it, one of the interesting things he talks about also is he says, uh, we, can, we can sort of relate to this. He says that um, he was a rabbi also. He happened to be a rabbi and a physician. And he said he couldn't deliver his sermons on the weekly Shabbos because the synagogues were closed. Sound familiar? So he actually delivered his sermon from the balcony of a street in the ghetto of Rome. And that's how he delivered his sermon back in the 1600s during the, uh, during the plague of the, uh, of the 1600s. And he, and he talks about uh, some of the restrictions then, you couldn't leave the ghetto. Uh, and we actually have some, some countries, not the United States, uh, or not mostly in the United States, um, place significant restrictions. If you violate the restrictions today of, uh, of, uh, of isolation, you know, some, in some places you can get fined, uh, some places you can even get thrown in jail if you violate, if you're found to be COVID positive and you, uh, and you violate your, uh, your, your isolation, your quarantine requirements. So he tells of the city of Rome back in the 1680s that if you violated some of the rules of the city government and you went outside the house in times where you shouldn't go outside the house and you gathered together, you congregated in large groups of people, in order to prevent that and as a deterrent to that, they had a gallows that hung, that, that was constructed outside the, the ghetto of Rome. And I apologize, uh, maybe later I can pull the, the illustration for you, but there is an illustration of that very gallows uh, that was a deterrent that if you violated those rules, you would, could actually be hung on the gallows. So they were quite serious about uh, back in those days about how they, how they dealt with these kinds of things. So what did he write about, uh, um, about the smallpox? Um, and there will be some Hebrew texts here. I apologize for any Hebrew texts. They will all be translated, uh, so fear, fear not. 
And he says, what is the reason of mahi sibat choli morbili verosella, verocelia, which is uh, smallpox. Um, and it's, there, there are different names of smallpox. There's ababuot, variola. Ver, so in, in the pre-modern literature, they had uh, some, a number of different uh, synonyms. So he's writing again in the pre-modern era, sibat cholizehu dam nida. So he said it's related to the menstrual blood of the woman. That's what, that what was, that's, that is the theory that he, uh, that he maintained at that time. Um, and just to give you an idea how things were before the modern era also, there was a, a question asked to a rabbi in the, in the 17th, 18th century, uh, Rabbi Yair Bachrach. And the question asked to him was if they could use the following treatment uh, for this, uh, for, for, for someone who contracted smallpox. And what was the treatment? Again, here it is in Hebrew, but I'll just synopsize, for, synopsize it for you. Um, that they would take the, uh, the ring, um, and they would take the ring of someone who had uh, died, and they would uh, use this ring to hold uh, and transfer the disease into this, uh, into the, into the person that, uh, that died. And so you could be relieved of the disease. It's an interesting concept in, in medical history, um, known as, uh, as transference. Uh, that was one of the crazy, uh, theories of, uh, of treatment for that particular disease at that time. And this same uh, author also talked about what, uh, what are called the so-called four humors, etc. What is interesting is that another treatment is in the context of the Torah, which, which we're even doing to this very day for, for a number of diseases. So you may be familiar if you've uh, done any reading of the Talmud, especially in the, the tractate of uh, Ta'anit, uh, which refers to fasting, um, that there was in the past fasting for times of drought. So not only was there fasting for times of drought, there was also fasting for times of pandemic, for times of disease. Uh, as we have here in the uh, in one of the commentaries called the Mugging Avraham, that if there was a time of pandemic, people would uh, people would actually fast. What, one of the other aspects of uh, pandemics in the past, which we are also experiencing today, uh, is uh, some people would often uh, flee the cities that they were in, and there was an interesting debate in rabbinic literature whether one is permitted or obligated to leave their place of dwelling during the times of a pandemic. And you have here some rabbinic sources that discuss this issue. The Talmud even discusses about during a pandemic, one should preferably stay in one's own place. Uh, it doesn't use the term isolation per se, but it says one should stay in one's place. Uh, and here you have on the right-hand side, the introduction to a work written by a famous rabbinic figure of Moshe Isserlis, uh, otherwise known as Ramah, who's, who was uh, one of the great uh, codifiers of Jewish law in the 16th century, um, whose work is included in the Shulchan Aruch, which is uh, one of the key rabbinic texts for us in the, uh, even to this very day. And uh, in this introduction, he writes how he, uh, he left Krakow and he was betoch ha he was exiled uh, to the city of Shidlov, and he writes machmas ipush ha'avir. Why did he leave the city of Krakow? Uh, because of the putrefied air. What does putrefied air mean? So this is an expression you'll find in rabbinic literature. That was the perception of contagion in those days. They, they didn't understand bacteriology, virology as we do today. They, they uh, thought that the disease was carried somehow through the air, that the air itself uh, was rotting or the air itself was putrefied. And if that was the case, uh, the only solution was for you to leave that area. You couldn't stay in that area with this putrefied uh, with this putrefied air. There were special prayers composed for times of, of plague and for times of uh, smallpox. Uh, here you have a number of different uh, prayers which were composed from the 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s. This is a prayer for Dever, which is the general term for plague. Dever, by the way, is, is one of the 10 plagues. It's called Dever, but also the term Dever is, is uh, colloquially used to, to describe all forms of plague. Uh, this one was for a disease called 
cholera, tikkun lechole ha cholera. Um, and cholera, uh, this one was in the, uh, in the 1800s, 1866. Cholera was a, a pandemic which afflicted uh, communities for centuries. Uh, really in the 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries, there were six long pandemics of cholera, each spanning many, many years. One of the aspects uh, also which uh, impacted the Jewish community during times of, of a plague, during times of infectious disease, was, was visiting the sick. So you may be familiar today, there are a number of extraordinary organizations called Bikur Cholim societies. Bikur Cholim means to visit the sick. Uh, these are not societies that are a product of the 20th or 21st century. There have been Bikur Cholim societies for many, many centuries. Uh, an integral part of every Jewish community is, uh, is taking care of the ill, visiting the ill, attending to their needs. How does infectious disease impact that obligation to take care of the, uh, of the ill uh, if you could potentially expose yourself to disease? And therein lies one of the interesting halachic uh, discussions about infectious disease. How much risk do you have to take in order to treat? And I'm, uh, I'm an emergency physician, as we said. One of the issues that I personally considered uh, in, uh, back in March and April is how much risk I have to take. I'm not as young as I used to be. Um, I'm not quite into the high risk category, but I was, you know, at those stages, they weren't sure uh, what the high risk categories were. And there was discussion that people of my age were for relatively high risk categories. Uh, so my question was, should I even be going into the emergency room? Uh, in, in those days, back in March and April, uh, literally 95 to 99% of the patients that we saw on a daily basis were COVID patients. So it was really, the entire environment was really a COVID environment. Uh, so that was a, it was a very serious uh, issue, halachic discussion for me personally. I, I ended up contracting the disease, which sort of solved the dilemma for me. Uh, and fortunately, because I'd contracted and developed antibodies, I was able to return uh, with, less, uh, with less concern. But here you have a, in front of you one of the manuals which was distributed to members of the Beaker Holing Society in 1750 in Germany. And it is written there, Gam ki balnu aleinu levaker kol choli chutz im yebo chas v'sholom eizo choli sh'enishchiach. So we, the Biker Cholim Society, have taken upon ourselves to visit, um, visit uh, all the sick people, except, except if they uh, have certain diseases which are contagious diseases. And if they have a contagious disease, then we are absolved from, from our obligation of visiting the sick. What are the two diseases? I pulled them out over here. Uh, there are two of a number of them. Pakin, and uh, you can probably guess what Pakin is. Uh, those of you who want to guess in the chat, you can, uh, you can, you can uh, take a guess. And, uh, and Mazelin. So I'll share with you what those are. You can probably guess they are Pakin is smallpox. Good, good. And uh, um, is it Aviel? Aviel said the pocket is smallpox and mazeline is measles. So this is 1750. Measles, which we'll talk about briefly towards the end of our discussion, uh, is one of these uh, diseases for which they understood was a contagious disease and you were absolved from your, from your obligation. By the way, one of the questions in the chat is what's the difference between Dever and Magefa? Uh, good question. So a lot of these are used interchangeably. Magefa uh, clearly refers to plague, uh, although in, in the Torah and, and, and in the prophets and Tanakh, you'll find the word Magefa not only for medical plague, um, but plague caused by uh, supernatural causes as well, um, even as is Dever. So the truth is that they are to a certain extent used interchangeably. It's basically devastating disease that affects uh, indiscriminately large, large groups of people. Uh, this was also an aspect which I think we can relate to today. This is the fear of contagion from the physician. This is a 19th century responsum um, to the Nishmas Kolchai, to a uh, rabbi in, in Izmir in Turkey. Uh, and what was the question? Here's the translation at the bottom. So the rabbi was asked regarding a physician member of a synagogue who treated patients during the plague and who wished to pray in synagogue. Other congregants protested out of a concern that they might contract the disease. So this is, this is a question, the following question, this is a very real question, very contemporary question. Uh, I was treating COVID patients every day. Is it appropriate for me to go from the hospital and to pray in a synagogue? 
um, knowing that there's potential that I could have contracted the disease and then, God forbid, convey it to other people. Uh, so Rabbi Usher Weiss, one of the great rabbinic authorities in, in Israel today, actually, and, and by the way, in, in my uh, hospital, which is the case in a number of New York area hospitals, there is a synagogue. There's a small synagogue there where doctors would come to pray uh, every day. We, we usually aren't able to have chakras morning prayers, but we, we usually have uh, afternoon prayers. We usually have mincha, and sometimes we can have marav too, especially in the winter, not so much in the, uh, in the, uh, in the summertime because doctors are still in the hospital when, uh, when the sun, when the stars come out uh, in around four or five, five o'clock these days. Uh, but Rabbi Weiss actually recommended that the doctors, even in the hospital, not go to synagogue because of the fear of, of transmitting disease. And in fact, our synagogue in Montefiore was closed down during the pandemic times for fear that doctors in the hospital working with COVID patients would contract the disease and then uh, potentially transmit it to others in shul. Um, this this disease, smallpox, which we're talking about, just to give you a little perspective about about uh, you know death in the uh, from from pandemics throughout the throughout the centuries, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, 300 million people died of smallpox. That's roughly the population of the United States. Um, we have now um, in this pandemic. Uh, there, there's been over a million deaths in this pandemic. There's been a few hundred thousand deaths uh, here in this country, uh, but thankfully nothing, uh, nothing approximating 300 million people dying over this prolonged uh, period of time from one disease, from the disease of smallpox, which, uh, which gets us to our, our discussion about the treatment for smallpox. Uh, you can imagine a disease with, with, uh, with such devastation when there was a potential treatment that developed, there was extraordinary excitement about this kind of treatment. Uh, what was the treatment? So this treatment was a treatment that was unique in all of medical history. How so? Here you have depicted for you two illustrations um, of this a treatment called inoculation. So what was the treatment? Here is a child sick from, from uh, smallpox. The physician here incises one of the pox with a small uh, scalpel and remove some of the fluid from that from that uh, little vesicle and then here in this next illustration they're not necessarily combined they're not together not by the same artist uh, in this illustration the uh, the physician is taking that same fluid that they pulled from a sick patient and they are injecting it into a small healthy infant now what is to keep in mind, this is before Ed, uh, Ed, uh, Edward Robert Koch, this is before the understanding of, uh, of the causation of disease from bacteria or from viruses. What exactly were they thinking uh, in, in the early 1700s um, and late 1700s in doing this kind of procedure? So the thought process was as follows. They thought that if you took a small amount of this, of this virus, and, uh, and injected it into a patient when they were healthy and not otherwise debilitated or otherwise sick or weak or malnourished, the odds are that they would contract hopefully a mild form of the disease, but they would not contract a severe form of the disease. Uh, and in fact, that's what happened. In the majority of cases, people contracted a relatively small form of the disease uh, and did not contract a severe form of disease. However, uh, keep in mind, this really is the first case of, I mean, it's anachronistic to say vaccination, and then I'll tell you in a moment what the, what the etymology of the word vaccination comes from. Um, but it, this really was injecting a live virus into the human being for the first time ever in history. Now, we know, and uh, again, not the topic of our discussion today about the history specific of vaccinations. We, today, we're talking about uh, uh, about Pfizer and Moderna viruses, which are both uh, very unique and novel forms of vaccination using mRNA technology, which is really extraordinary. But the old classic viruses were either killed virus or live attenuated virus, uh, meaning that the virus itself was injected into the body, but the virus was manipulated to such an extent that it wouldn't really cause harm to the individual. This was injecting the very virus, the very live virus. And when one does that, there is a chance that people are going to die. And in fact, in these early forms of inoculation, a percentage of people did die. And here you have a tombstone, which is not far from where I am sitting. I, I live in Long Island. 
This is a tombstone in Huntington, Long Island, which is maybe a 15, 20 minute drive from here. And it reads, in memory of Peleg, son of Thomas and Mary Conklin, who died of the smallpox by inoculation, January 27th, 1788, 17 years old. 17 year old kid who uh, was healthy, was not sick and, uh, and received the vaccination or inoculation and, uh, and died as a result. So the, the interesting uh, halachic question, uh, and, and I'll uh, share with um, you some of this. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry, does someone have a question? Yeah, Dr. Reichman, I had a quick question. Um, yeah, back sure then, how would they inoculate someone back then? How would they physically do it? Yeah. So they, they did it basically like a little scalpel. They'd take a scalpel and they'd extract a little bit of the fluid from the pox and they'd take, they'd put a little bit of that fluid on a needle basically and inject that needle into the skin. There, there actually was an, another form of this inoculation where they'd put some of the pox in, uh, in food, in, in, in raisins and they'd, and they'd crush it in their palm and mix the pox with raisins and they'd ingest it orally in the hopes that that would also cause some uh, protection for disease. But the standard type of inoculation was, was an injection with a, with a needle. It wasn't a syringe like we have today, uh, but it was literally like puncturing a little hole into the uh, skin, like a subcutaneous injection and injecting the material uh, subcutaneously. Thank you. Uh, um, sure, sure. And, and by the way, anyone else, uh, don't hesitate to, to chime in with any questions. Again, uh, and I'm always happy to entertain questions. So just to give you an idea of the impact of smallpox on the world, um, this is a, its impact on American history. In, in December of 1775, in a letter to the Continental Congress, uh, George Washington uh, was commenting on a, a belief that the British were going to use biological warfare and, uh, and infect the American troops with smallpox and thereby decimate the American troops in that fashion. So when he heard this rumor that the British were trying to spread smallpox near Boston, uh, George Washington called smallpox his most dangerous enemy. And the, and the, the question that he had, and by the way, his, his uh, compatriot, uh, Benjamin Franklin, also had what to say about, uh, about smallpox. Uh, and he had a personal loss from smallpox. In 1736, this is from his, uh, his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. Um, and he wrote, by the way, in terms of the risk of the disease, he reported on 72 Bostonians inoculated in March of 1730. Two died while the rest recovered in perfect health. Um, of those who had it in the common way, which means those who contracted it spontaneously didn't, didn't receive the, uh, the inoculation, it is computed that one in four died. 25% of those who contracted spontaneous smallpox died. Two out of 72 um, died from, uh, from the inoculation. And he reports on a personal note, in 1736, I lost one of my sons, a fine boy of four years old by the smallpox. Uh, I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given it to him by inoculation. This I mention for the sake of parents who omit that operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if a child died under it, my example showing, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he tells everybody uh, that they should vaccinate um, to, save, uh, to save their children. Um, this wasn't only impacting the non-Jewish community, uh, the Jewish community was afflicted by this also. And, and a rabbi in, in London by the name of Shlomo Nansich lost two children to the disease smallpox. And when he heard about this inoculation, he was very excited. But like any Jew, his question was, is this inoculation halachically appropriate? Is it okay for us to do this from a Jewish legal perspective? And what was the question? The question was as follows. And this, this is the, a really fascinating question. The Torah tells us, and this, this is a, the undercurrent of all our discussions that we will ever have in, in the relationship to science and medicine and Jewish law. The Torah tells us, um, Virapo yurape, and you shall surely heal. We have an obligation to, uh, to heal. And, and that's really so-called license of the physician to heal. Because some might say if God uh, bestows illness, maybe God should be the one to heal. Maybe man shouldn't intervene in the process. We don't believe that way. We believe that man can intervene in the process. Man has a license to intervene in the process. Um, as long as on the proviso that man realizes that we are just messengers in this world um, to help achieve uh, ultimately the uh, God's results of helping, helping cure people. So that allows you to heal someone who's sick. 
What is inoculation? Inoculation is very different. Inoculation is actively injecting disease into a healthy person. They're not sick. They're completely healthy. So the question is, this child, Peleg, son of Thomas and Mary Conklin, who died by inoculation in the, in the 1700s, the physician, or perhaps even barber surgeon in those days, who, who injected him with, that, uh, with the, that smallpox, is he a healer or is he a murderer? What is his status? Um, because after all, the child was healthy. And had he not come along and injected him, the child may have never contracted the disease and he may have survived to a long and healthy life. So that's really part of the question. Is this under the rubric of the license to heal or perhaps we can only heal someone who's sick. We can't necessarily inject someone with a disease albeit for the purpose of protecting them from more severe disease. Uh, so this question was, uh, was answered um, in, a, in a commentary on the text of the Mishnah. And here I'll, I'll read this for you in the, in the uh, original Hebrew. After a lengthy analysis, the Rabbi Israel Lipschitz wrote, Umizen nearly heter laasos, and for those of you who can follow along in the Hebrew, this is a little challenging, these few words. It says, it appears to me that it is permissible to perform inoculation shell pakin, smallpox inoculation. And what is his, what is his logic behind this? He says, inoculation, even though it's true, and his statistics are rounded off, they're not, they're not the same as Benjamin Franklin's statistics. But he writes, even though one in a thousand die as a result of inoculation, meaning people will die as a result of inoculation, if you allow people exactly like Benjamin Franklin's logic, if, if, you, if you allow people to contract a disease spontaneously, the likelihood of death is far higher. So on the aggregate, in terms of risk-benefit ratio, yes, there is a significant risk to inoculation, but if you don't inoculate, the risk is gonna be significantly higher. There were discussions back then of whether one could inoculate on the Shabbos. And you have Rabbi Eliezer Fleckles, uh, who lived in the late 18th, early 19th century. And I'm not gonna read this inside, and it's gonna share with you what the analysis was. One of the issues that we deal with on a, on, a, on a very frequent basis in the world of science and medicine is the practice of medicine on Shabbos. Shabbos has a lot of, uh, of, um, of laws relating to Shabbos, many things that, uh, that many restrictions on Shabbos, in addition to the wonderful positive aspects of Shabbos. Uh, and uh, there are many, many articles, books, lectures on the practice of medicine on Shabbos, training on Shabbos, practicing on Shabbos, um, and perhaps that'll come up in, uh, in, in your future lectures or discussions. So the question here was, and, you're, and there's no question, by the way, one of the absolute clear laws of Judaism is that you are allowed to violate the laws of Shabbos to save somebody's life. That is an absolute uh, principle. So if someone's life is at risk, you can violate all the laws of Shabbos, except uh, three laws you're not allowed to commit murder to save someone's life and, uh, and uh, two others as well. But, but, the, uh, but in, this, in essence, the majority of the Torah you're allowed to, to supersede or violate in order to preserve life. Question is, in those days, uh, the, the vaccination, the, this was inoculation. The inoculation was going from town to town. And... Um, Sometimes the barber surgeons or the clinicians that would be administering the, this inoculation would come to your town one day, they'd be going from town to town and they'd leave your town and they wouldn't come back again. That would be it. So if uh, it's a one and done, and if you didn't get your inoculation on that day, that was it, you'd miss out. So now we are all talking about vaccination in the 21st century. Um, can we vaccinate? How do we obtain vaccination? Everyone here is uh, struggling, even the physicians, my, my fellow colleagues, our uh, physicians are, are struggling to find out how they can procure the vaccination for themselves and their patients who are, at, who are at high risk. Is it possible to get the vaccination on a Shabbos? Are you allowed, if, if, the, if you have a, uh, an appointment and your appointment happens to be on Shabbos, are you allowed to get the vaccination on the Shabbos? So the question is, what's the problem? What would be the halachic prohibition of getting a vaccination? So one, which wasn't the issue back then, is can you travel? Can you take a car? Can you drive, which is normally a prohibition on Shabbos? Can you drive on Shabbos to get the vaccine? In those days, the discussion was, which is still discussion today, 
can you receive an injection cutting into the body, perhaps even causing drawing blood from the body, making a wound in the body, all fall under prohibitions which are, are prohibited on, the, uh, on Shabbos. So the question is, these people are healthy right now. Can you violate any aspect of Shabbos for someone who is healthy? Um, and the answer was, again, this is, has to be taken in the context of that time, smallpox was a pandemic. Not dissimilar to today's pandemic, actually worse than today's pandemic, where hundreds of millions of people died. There were no cures at that time. This was the very first vaccination. If you didn't get that, 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 uh, that shot, then, uh, then, then you wouldn't have any opportunity to protect yourself. So the thought was, and the response was, that even though the person is not sick right now, we would allow a limited violation of Shabbos, and you said you should try and minimize it to the best of your ability, in order to receive this injection, in order to protect you from, uh, from losing your life otherwise. Um, this, by the way, is, is the uh, Edward Jenner and the cure for smallpox, which, uh, which as I'll, I'll mention now, and, and just in terms of timing, I'm gonna go for about another 15 minutes. For those of you who need to leave or need to, uh, to, to do other things, feel free to do so. I'm not even remotely offended. Honestly, I can't even see if you're leaving because you're on Zoom, so you have that luxury. Uh, and, and I will also um, try and stay around a little bit after that for, uh, for, additional questions, um, for additional questions as well for those of you who are interested. But what, what happened to, uh, to smallpox? So what happened to smallpox is the, um, the work of, of Edward Jenner. Now, Edward Jenner is credited with the, the vaccination for smallpox. And I, you notice that I've been using the term inoculation until this point and calling Edward Jenner's uh, invention a vaccination. Why? Because uh, what Edward Jenner discovered is, is the following. And this wasn't his idea. He tested an idea which had been floating around at the time. That people that uh, these, these uh, people used to milk the cows, the milk maidens as they were called, would often contract a disease from those cows they were milking. Um, and that, uh, all right, so you see here, Naftali writes me, we have actually have another session. What time does that session start, uh, Naftali? You can tell me, I can uh, does it start now, I can cl close now, or it starts at 2.15. Um, Rabbi Katz, what time? Um, I think we're I think we're going to start that session at two thirty. Um, so if I guess if you finish in fifteen minutes, we'll have a fifteen minute break. Okay, great, great. So I'll finish by I'll be done by two fifteen. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So uh, what Edward Jenner noticed is that um, these these women uh, contracted cowpox. They didn't. They they never contracted a fatal form of smallpox. So what he did is he, uh, in, a, in an experiment probably, which wouldn't uh, pass the, uh, your ethics committee uh, today, uh, he injected a number of people with cowpox and then there, shortly thereafter injected them with smallpox. And, they, uh, and he found that the overwhelming majority of them did not contract a fatal form of smallpox. Why is this procedure called vaccination? For those of you who learn Latin, which is probably almost none of you these days, I didn't learn Latin either, but Latin was a requirement for medical training um, in, in previous centuries, uh, the, the Latin for cow is vaca. Vaca is Latin for cow. So the very term vaccination really owes its origin to the cow of cowpox, uh, which was part of the experiments of Edward Jenner. That's why it's called, uh, that's why it's called vaccination. Um, just so you realize there was opposition to vaccination uh, even back in the 1700s. And what was the opposition to vaccination? The opposition to vaccination was that since it, the, the injection came from a diseased cow, people believed that the, the, uh, this cow injecting a derivative from an animal into a human being would impact the human being in negative ways. And here you see a, uh, an illustration of that from James Gilray, uh, was contemporary of uh, of, uh, of the of the, of the vaccination, and it shows people morphing into cows. You see, this woman is becoming a cow, and there's a cow coming out of uh, this person's arm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just by the way, uh, and I'm going to mention this briefly, we'll, uh, just so you, so you have an interesting uh, factoid. There is a picture in this illustration. I'm gonna ask you guys in the chat to take a close look at that picture. 
And who wants to guess what that is a picture of? Can anybody guess what this picture, you see the bottom of the frame here, what is this a picture of? Anyone wanna guess? Uh, I'll give you guys 30 seconds. Very good, excellent. So a number of you typed in and you are absolutely correct. It is a picture of the Egel Hazahav, the picture of the golden calf. And the question you have to ask yourselves is why is a picture of the Egel Hazav in the midst of this anti-vaccination illustration? Uh, so, uh, so one of the obvious reasons is that uh, just like the Jews were praying to a false god, these people believed that, that uh, vaccination was a false god, so to speak, and that it really was not effective. And you have the, uh, the anti-vaccination movements uh, trace themselves back even to the times of, uh, of Edward Jenner. Um, by the way, the, the, uh, even some of the Jews back then uh, in the times of the smallpox were opposed to vaccination. I share this with you as an instructive point. In the late 1800s, a Jewish man by the name of Mr. Levy claimed that, uh, that he, uh, he could not vaccinate because as a Jew, it was prohibited for him to vaccinate. And he lived in England. In England at that time, the law was you were required to vaccinate. So uh, what did he do? Uh, he was thrown into jail uh, for violating the law, but he claimed religious exemption. Maybe he shouldn't be put in jail. Uh, so his, his, the, the, uh, the district attorney who threw him in jail happened to be Jewish. And he, he, was, uh, he was feeling a little guilty throwing a fellow Jew into jail. So he approached the, the chief rabbi of that time, Rabbi Adler, who was the chief rabbi in England. He said, Rabbi, let me ask you a question. And keep, keep, keep in mind, this was the only vaccination then. There were no other vaccinations. So he said to the rabbi, is it true? Can a Jew claim religious exemption from vaccination? So what did the rabbi say? Rabbi said he was not justified in making the statements contained in the letter that the most competent medical authorities were agreed as to vaccination being prophylactic against smallpox and added its use was in perfect consonance with the letter and spirit of Judaism. Um, the question is, and I'll just say this very briefly because uh, it requires a lengthier discussion. Can any Jew today claim religious exemption from vaccinations? From uh, We had the issue of, of measles last year about the Orthodox Jews refusing to vaccinate. We have uh, even discussions now about people refusing to vaccinate. Can a Jew claim religious exemption? So the short answer is absolutely not. To claim religious exemption, the law has to be in your religion that you are prohibited from vaccinating. There is no law, none, that says you are prohibited to, from vaccinating. Not a single law in the Torah that says you are prohibited from vaccinating. You may not be obligated to vaccinate, but you're not. Uh, you're definitely not prohibited from vaccination. In fact, many, many rabbis across the centuries have strongly advocated, and even today with the COVID-19 vaccine, there are a number of rabbis who have said explicitly that uh, that we should we should vaccinate even might be obligated according to the Torah to uh, to vaccinate. Um, what I'm actually going to do is, uh, in the interest of time, I'm uh, let me just see if there's any other additional slides I want to share with you, uh, and then we'll open up for questions for the last few moments. Vaccination. Just to fast forward to the 21st century, we moved from one vaccine for smallpox to dozens and dozens of vaccines. This is a vaccine uh, list for, for childhood vaccinations in the 21st century. Um, we've had those claim that there's a vaccination is associated with autism. And for those of you who are familiar, uh, this is a study by uh, Dr. Wakefield. Um, this study actually has been retracted uh, by virtue of its unethical and inappropriate uh, um, aspects of the study. Um, but vaccination today has become a very popular and has, is more responsible. Uh, I'll leave this up for a second to share with you. Vaccination, when they asked in the year 2000, in the last 2000 years, what is the greatest development in all of medicine? The answer, the number one answer, vaccination. Vaccination, all told, has saved more human lives than any other intervention in the entire world of medicine. What's fascinating is that we are talking now about COVID-19. Literally a year ago, a little over a year ago, we were, uh, we were talking about measles. 
uh, an extremely contagious disease, far more contagious probably than COVID-19. And this actually, this little bubble that I'm standing next to was the contraption that we would transport patients who had measles up to the medical floor because the contagion of this disease is so great that it could even be transmitted when you're moving a patient from the, from the hospital, from the ER to the floor. COVID-19 is not this contagious, but little did we know when we're dealing with measles, which is a far less fatal disease, that just a year later we'd be dealing with, uh, with COVID-19. So let me, uh, let me end here uh, with a brief comment and then I'll open up for any, any questions that you have. Um, we have um, we've had an opportunity to give you a little bit of historical perspective. Uh, today we're talking about the COVID-19 uh, vaccination, which is on all of our minds. What many of us don't realize is that the vaccination has a, a very long and storied past. And that uh, throughout that history, of vaccination, the uh, the rabbis of, of each time were addressing and dealing with the the Jewish legal issues that uh, that were reflected in in those developments. The uh, just to share with you also that is exactly what's going on today as well. There's been a development of this vaccine, multiple different vaccines. The rabbis of today. Uh, are discussing many legal issues relating to the COVID-19 vaccination, including should one receive it, as we said before, is one obligated to receive it? Um, what uh, can one receive it? Rosh Weiss has uh, halachic discussions about receiving a vaccination on Shabbos and says that if you walk to the clinic and uh, you yourself don't do any specific violations, you, you might be able to receive vaccine on Shabbos. To even the topic of should you say a blessing when you receive the vaccination. And, and the latest discussion is literally over the last few days, a number of great rabbinic authorities, both in the United States and in Israel, have recited specific blessings upon the receipt of this vaccine. And there, there are three or four different candidates, not, not for our discussion today. Should you say the Shehechiyanu blessing, uh, thanking you to that you have uh, brought us to this day. Should you say a particular bracha called Hatov Ha'metiv? Should you say a, uh, another prayer which was in the Talmud? But whatever prayer you say, the point is that we are now at a point in this uh, uh, in this pandemic that we've shifted our prayers to thank God for the development of the vaccine, and hopefully, God willing, we can uh, we can all ride this through and be able to see each other. Uh, unmasked, not only on Zoom, but unmasked actually in person. So I thank you all for the opportunity to uh, to uh, spend this time with you, and I'm happy to open up for any questions for the last few minutes.